yeah, I had to learn how to slow down. I had to slow down and, and everyone, and what was amazing was they were fine with it. It was just, so I, I had all these beliefs that I can't all these, everyone else is fine. Thrive Friends, this is your host, Dr. Solomon, How to Crack the Leadership Code. Today, I'm joined by a special guest, Alain Huck. He is a TEDx speaker, author of number one best-selling book on Amazon, Cracking the Leadership Code. Alain is a keynote speaker, leadership coach with over 20 years of experience in 25 different countries. He is a regular contributor to Fast Company, Forbes, Business Insider, among many other leading management magazines. Hello, welcome on Thrive. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Congratulations on your latest book, Cracking the Leadership Code. Thank you. Lots have been written about leadership, Alain. What motivated you to write another book in this genre? Great, thank you. Such a good question. So just to do a little level setting, I didn't just go, hmm, I'd like to write a book. Let me sit down and write this. In fact, so as you said, I've been spending over 20 years as a practitioner that is out in the field with real organizations, with real teams and real leaders, helping them work through their struggles as a coach, as a trainer, as a facilitator. And so it's not so much that I sat down to write the book is that what I started noticing were these patterns of behavior. I kept seeing that the best leaders all had certain traits in common and the lousy leaders all had certain traits in common. And so what I started doing was taking notes because I know people learn through stories. So I'd hear a good story that would bring a certain principle or behavior to life. And I'd turn that into a note and that became a story and the story turned into a blog post. And I started publishing a blog in about 2011 and I didn't miss a single posting. I published once a week and I didn't miss a posting for over four years. Well, four years later, I have over 250 posts and I started reading through them and looking for what were the common themes and the trends. And what I noticed that there were these three overarching themes and actually these three meta skills that kept showing up time and time again. And those three meta skills have become the subtitle of the book. So the book is called Cracking the Leadership Code. The subtitle are Three Secrets to Becoming a Strong Leader. And the three meta skills are connection, communication, and collaboration. And so for me, writing was about taking my work as ultimately as an adult educator and using the written form to basically distill 20 years of working with thousands of people so that I could accelerate people's learning curve and give them a practical roadmap for here are some specific things that you can do to become a better leader. And not only just share the things, because look, if it was just a list of prescriptions, we'd have a lot better leaders than we do now. It's not just that. It's also taking a look at why is this so hard? Because it's not natural for us to lead. Okay. It's, it's a learned skill. And there are things that get in our way, such as ego, fear, control, power. So I dive into all those things as well. And I think it's important for us to be able to simmer in that leadership pot to understand how you cook a leader and be able to come out of it. So you actually know how to be effective and become the leader that not just you want to be, but that people are yearning for in this year and beyond. How to cook a leader. How to cook a leader. Yeah. We're baking leaders. It's right. It's a cookbook. How's that for a metaphor? (laughs) <laughs> and it is true, as you mentioned, leadership is not natural and it can be a taught skill. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. It's, it is a taught skill and it starts with evaluating your mindset, right? Because you don't get to just enabling a new behavior without questioning what are the beliefs around, can you even do this behavior? For example, do you see the people you lead in a role of they are there to do my bidding or are they there because I'm here to serve them so they can release their potential. Those are two very different paradigms to see the leader follower relationship through. And so part of the the book, the first whole section before we get into connection, communication and collaboration is around context and showing that, that what I call the old school leadership or command and control authoritarian style that worked only to a point And it worked well in an industrial age, an industrial economy where literally humans were meant, as Henry Ford said famously of his employees on the Ford assembly line, he said, why is it every time I want a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached, where literally humans were labor, just seen as a pair of hands. That is not the world that we live in anymore. And so, yes, it is about shifting your paradigm and changing your beliefs and then adopting these new skills so that you can crack that leadership code. Thank you for sharing this, Alain. And I would like to follow up 
on your answer, especially with the theme about connection, communication, and collaboration. In your opinion, how could leaders apply these three elements, leading teams remotely across different time zones and cultures in the post-pandemic era? Yeah, so important. And it's funny, you know, because the book came out on March the 24th, 2020, right as the world shut down. And it turns out that these principles that were applicable pre-pandemic are perhaps even more applicable now because they get to the fundamental core of leadership. And my belief around the core of leadership is at its core leadership, it isn't about a job title or a position. At its core, what are we doing when we're leading? We are trying to influence someone and that someone could be just us and or it could be someone else. We're trying to influence someone to get something done. So at its core, leadership is a human to human relationship. And what is at the heart of human relationships? It's connection. And so if we think about leading from a distance across time zones, so now, because you don't have the face-to-face -face casualness of just showing up at the office, you have to be that much more intentional in your leadership around what can I do to connect with this person through the intermediary of a Zoom screen or whatever else technology? What am I doing to make them feel valued as a human being first? You know, and the fact is right now, there's actually this golden opportunity to connect with people. And the golden opportunity is we have a global pandemic that has impacted everyone. Now, it hasn't impacted everyone equally. Yes, we are all definitely in the same storm. We're in different boats. But, you know, also this is cracked open. It's not just it's a pandemic. This is literally about life and death. And so now it's much more common when people say, how are you today? They're not looking for a, I'm fine. How are you? Right? Because the pandemic and the world that we're living in has shifted where we're going, oh my gosh, like what's really important? And so many organizations I work with now are really helping, they're helping their leaders and their culture. They're trying to go, what is our purpose? Because, you know, people are crying out for, why am I doing this? You know, there's more to life than a paycheck. And I, you know, especially if you look at the demographics around millennials and Gen Z, number one thing they want is to continue to learn and to grow and to have a sense of purpose. And so there's this golden opportunity for leaders to lean in and be exceptionally human. It starts with a simple question, which is, Dr. Solomon, how are you today? And really hold the space and listen for the answer, as opposed to just jumping into task mode. I will share with you something interesting. When I first came to the States, someone told me, when someone asks you, how are you doing? You have to say, I'm fine. They're not really looking for an answer. If they want to know an answer, they will ask you, how are you feeling? Are things okay? But how are you doing is almost equivalent to hello. Yeah, exactly. It's a cultural placeholder. I'm fine. How are you? Before yeah. we move to the next part, I would like to ask the audience watching us to open a new tab and look up Alain Hunkins, A-L-A-I-N. Hunkins, H-U-N-K-I-N-S dot com. Don't forget to download his book, Navigating Trust, and you can download it for free. In addition, you can check his 30-day leadership challenge. I'm not going to spill the beans here. Go check it for yourself and let me know and let Alain know your thoughts about the program. Alain, you talked about connection, communication, and collaboration. What are some of the practical steps that you talk about in your book to build this, especially for leaders who have trouble building this connection and communication just based on their personality or because they really don't know how to do that? Yeah. And I think a lot of us don't know because we've never really seen it role modeled. It's very hard to do something that you've never actually seen. You can read it in a book in theory, but how do you do it? So let's talk, for example, around connection. Now, we talked a little bit about it so far, but practically the number one fast track to connection is empathy. And empathy, I define as just showing people that you understand them and that you care how they feel. Now, you already do this with people that you're very close to. So if you think about what do you do with the people that you're close to, how can you apply that maybe with employees or colleagues or customers? Uh, the number one thing that gets in the way of empathy, again, if it's showing people that you understand them and care how they feel, Number one thing I see that shows up that it gets in the way is time, right? Because our world, our digital world travels at the speed of light. Technology, emails, internet travels at the speed of light. Human relationships travel at the speed of humans, much more slower timed. And so showing empathy means showing patience. So what you can do is show up, park your agenda, eliminate distractions, put your phone down, do one thing at a time, don't multitask, and listen. Ask really good open-ended questions. And listen and follow up and notice what's going on and be comfortable with silences, right? Being curious, being open, asking questions and listening. I call it listening with purpose, which is very different than the way most of us listen. So if you start to do that and lean into that, 
it's going to make a huge difference. So that's one of the biggest things you can do around connection. The other thing around connection turns out that credibility is so important because as one of my mentors says, we're not going to believe the message if we don't believe the messenger. So you want to be credible or believable in the eyes of the people that you lead. It's about how do they see you, not about how you see yourself. So three simple things you can do to increase your levels of credibility. Number one, show up on time. Why do I say that? Because presence or absence is the easiest thing in the world to measure. And we all basically, once that first checkbox is like on time or late, we set into motion a halo effect, right? Are you seen as prompt, responsible, reliable person or... I don't know, not so dependable, right? And again, this might be different globally. I know there's different contexts around timeliness, but certainly working in a, a North American culture, timeliness counts. That's number one, showing up on time. Number two, do what you say you're going to do, which means you have to keep track of your commitments. You can't just say, yeah, I'll do that. And then go unconscious and forget about it because that is what's going to build your track record of consistency and credibility. And number three is be consistent over time. It isn't about showing up once or twice. It's how do you show up consistently? Because that's what builds your reputation or what some of my colleagues might call your personal brand. Jeff Bezos, everyone knows who that is, said, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And so as a leader, and we all are leaders in our lives, it's not about your job title. What do you want people saying about you? And that's going to show up through, are you showing up on time? Are you doing what you say you're going to do? And are you consistent? And is that in alignment with your values of who you are? So those are some simple, practical things. Now I say simple, I didn't say it was easy, right? For you to start to work at, to start to become a better connector and ultimately to become a better leader. So that's this connection, for example. You stole my thunder here, Alain. I wanted to ask you about what causes employees to lose confidence in leadership. We have seen this happening maybe more than usual during the pandemic time. Many employees lost faith in organizational leadership because of how they handled a pandemic crisis. And my heart goes to these leaders because they haven't seen anything like this before. So there was no recipe. They were just doing whatever came to mind in a time where we didn't have any precedence for this for 100 years. Moving forward, say in the next five to 10 years, what do you think leaders can do to reset the confidence button with their employees? Yeah. So if we think about increasing confidence, and I I think we're going to see a massive migration of people leaving companies when they can, uh, because people are realizing I can't put up with this life. They're going to say life is too short, right? Because they've been through this pandemic. So I'm going to offer a little mnemonic around this ABC to remember what are things that you as a leader can do around this. Uh, number one, A is just ask more questions, right? So start leading by asking, leading by pulling information, right? When you ask, you're pulling information rather than by telling. And the challenge for many people in leadership roles is we got here because we were very skilled doers and high achievers. But there's a big difference between being a high achiever and facilitating high achievement in others. So start by asking more and better questions. And then, like we said earlier on connection, listen with purpose. That's A. B, be exceptionally human, right? So that means leaning into how can I be more human in this situation, right? So that means having more empathy, having some more grace, having some more patience, seeking to understand and doing that as well. So, so basically be exceptionally human. People are looking for human leaders because when we have that, we can relax our physiology, our neurobiology starts to relax. We become psychologically safe and we can start to achieve better results. So everything we're talking about today, by the way, it's not about just soft and fluffy. It's a nice thing to do, as you probably know better than me. The science backs us up. This is the key and the recipe for high performance. So we've gone through A, B, C, check your assumptions, right? So what think about what were your assumptions when you came into the pandemic? They probably were, like a lot of leaders, like, oh, we've got to keep the ship, the doors open, the ship afloat, whatever. And what we didn't stop and go, hmm, to do that, what are my people feeling? What might they need in order to do the keeping the doors open, keeping the ship afloat? What are the answers? So checking your assumptions, right? It goes back to the whole conversation we had earlier around mindset and beliefs. What do I assume? And maybe I need to step back and question those things. You know, I'm sure you've seen the bumper sticker. It makes for good wisdom though, which is don't believe everything you think, especially the first time out. So right, ask better questions, be exceedingly human and check your assumptions. ABC. Again, it's all simple, not so easy. Before we move to the last part of this wonderful chat, I'd like to remind the audience to open a new tab, look up Alain Hunkins, 
website and the link is included in the YouTube description below. Check his book. You can find it on his website on Amazon. And then this is a question that I ask everyone on Thrive. We all have gone through setbacks where we managed to go from striving to thriving, myself included. Would you mind sharing one of yours with the audience as a source of motivation and inspiration and how you managed to overcome it? Sure, sure. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been at this work for 20 some odd years and uh, a few years ago, and I have been traveling around the world by 25 countries, whatever. And I always kind of prided myself on my persistence and my work ethic and my energy. And I'd show up and I kind of, you know, I come from a background of, I, I have an MFA in theater and there's this mindset, the show must go on, right? So going on. And so one of the things that happened to me a number of years ago, actually it wasn't that many, about five years ago, is I was doing a session for a client. I was leading a, a training program for a client in upstate New York. And it was the morning of the session. And by all accounts, when I woke up, I felt horrible. I should not have gone but I willed myself to go and I got, anyway, long story short, I'm there. I'm at the point where I cannot even sit in a chair as they're beginning the introduction. And I tried to leave the room and I leave the room and I black out. I faint, I pass out, hit my head. Someone comes, they take me in, a in, in an ambulance to the hospital. And yes, I've blacked out from, you know, what they call a syncope, fainting, but I also find out that I've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, an irregular heartbeat, which I may or may not have had for some time before. And then I had to deal with a whole issue of dealing with that. And that for me, Dr. Salman, was this wake up call. Wow. I mean, I say for me, so much had been around, I can do this. I can keep going. I can strive. And I look back at these moments where I didn't ask other people for help. And it isn't just physical for me. I think it was just sort of, I just, I know that about myself, a bit stubborn, a bit, I, I have independent. And that incident has really shifted my own relationship to patients, to understanding other people, being more compassionate uh, with others, with myself, not to mention a certain level of vulnerability. You know, and I'm now dealing with aging parents. My father is 79 and is dying of Parkinson's disease. Like he's in stage four, stage five Parkinson's. And I was talking to an elder friend of mine who's also about, he's about 84 years old. And he said, you know, death, there's a wonderful thing about death is that it gives life a sense of urgency. And so as he was saying that, that's what I'm noticing now. Is that, so this whole incident of the heart, a fib, my vulnerability has given a certain bittersweetness and aliveness to every day. And would I have wanted to go through it? Absolutely not. Has it offered me some great gifts? Absolutely it has. So that's a place where I think I've gone from striving and struggling to learning how to thrive more. What a story. Do you think in retrospect, part of it was being a man, like the masculinity mask where we usually try to push through, even if we know something is not right health-wise and avoid going to a physician because we can do it on our own? Yeah, I think some of that, you know, and it's funny because I've looked at my own masculinity under a microscope since I was 26, right? So it's been 20 some odd years since doing that. And I still think because some of those cultural signifiers are so strong. Yeah, I think so. You know, because I'm, you know, I'm dependable. I go, and I do this. And I'm achieving this. I've got a family to take care of and all those messages, you know, so versus ever stopping and going, how could something like this happen to me? It must have had a huge impact, not only on you and your way of thinking, but also the family and the family demands from you regarding your health. Yeah. I had to learn how to slow down. I had to slow down and, and everyone. And what was amazing was they were fine with it. It was just, so I, I had all these beliefs that I can't, all these, everyone else is fine, right? So it's, it teaches me again, that lesson of it turns out that the biggest critic turns out to be me of my own self in terms of the little gremlins, the little critics, the little saboteurs in my own head that are saying, no, no, you have to keep doing this. You know, the world is okay, you know, because everyone else is worrying about their own saboteurs and their own critics and their own gremlins. They're not thinking about mine. And so it's amazing. Also, when you ask people for help, you realize how much support and trust and love there is in the world for many of us. So I'm really grateful for learning those lessons as well. And I keep learning them. You know, I'm not perfect and I'm going to continue to learn those lessons, hopefully for a long time. Thank you so much for sharing this, Alain. And I hope it will be a motivation, inspiration, and a wake up call for those who don't have to wait until they get a medical diagnosis to slow down, whatever that medical diagnosis is. And sometimes takes us a major life event like this to realize life is too short and we need yeah. to slow down. What a pleasure to have you on Thrive, Alain. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon. It's really been a treat. Thank you. 
Thank you. People watching us, until we meet next time, keep safe, keep motivated, keep resilient, and see you in the next episode of Thrive. Thank you.